All right, welcome back for another of our, uh, in our series of episodes on the state of the church. This week, we are very blessed to have with us uh, uh, Mark DuPont. Uh, for those of you, I know a number of you already know Mark. For those of you who don't, uh, probably for many of the folks in Patria, our family, it would be, uh, you'd know his name most from uh, having worked with John Paul Jackson, in particular working with him on uh, the prophetic protocols document that we actually have included as one of our uh, protocols for our organization. So, uh, Mark, it's really good to both meet you, because I don't think I've ever met you before personally, and to have you with us today. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be with you, and uh, greetings to everybody who's watching this, and uh, great grace to you in this times of uh, so many questions going on. Well, that's, that, we're certainly in times of questions. When I started this series, I thought we were in mainly in questions about viruses and pandemics, and suddenly we're in the time of questions about viruses, pandemics, racism, how does the church respond? And really, honestly, Mark, what we've been looking at with this series of, of interviews is really just to hear from prophetic voices all over the nation. Uh, and, and I start the same way with everybody. What, what is the state of the church right now? Where are we at? What, what's going on? Well, uh, I, it's probably one of the most quoted line, literary lines in all of history, but uh, as Dickens said in one of his novels, it's the best of times and worst of times. And uh, I think that's quite biblical. I think the Apostle Paul uh, indicated that uh, there'd be a growing darkness in the last days over the cultures and Jesus spoke of wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, and droughts. The prophet said everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Um, but at the same time, um, and I guess uh, part of what I'm saying is from an international perspective, maybe not strictly uh, uh, an American perspective, but uh, probably 75% of my ministry is, is overseas, uh, ranging from Africa to Asia, quite a bit in uh, Western Europe and the UK. But, you know, it, we're living in an, an amazing time, I think, as far as the uh, growth of the kingdom of God. Um, although I haven't been to uh, Iran, uh, it's just amazing what's been going on the last two years with the underground church in Iran. And uh, it's basically an underground revival going on. And um, maybe I'll say more about that later uh, prophetically. But also in China, um, uh, we look at, you know, um, well, the last four months or so, everybody's looking at the uh, coronavirus 19 that came out of Wuhan in China. But it's interesting, I, I felt uh, four years ago the Lord say that the church internationally should really be paying attention to what's happening with the body of Christ in both China and Israel right now. Because as it goes in those areas, so it will go with the rest of the world. And lo, <coughs> lo and, <coughs> excuse me, Lo and behold, we have this uh, false crown that's uh, come out of Wuhan and obviously impacted pretty much the whole world. Uh, but uh, when I look at um, uh, times of extreme breakthrough of God's purposes here on earth, uh, such as uh, God causing Moses, the future deliverer, to be born, uh, you know, Pharaoh at that time was having all the male babies of the Hebrew people killed. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at the time when Jesus was born, Herod did the same thing. And any time we're about to approach a breakthrough, there is always tremendous demonic turmoil. Yeah. I hate to say it, but I think sometimes uh, the devil is more prophetic <laughs> than the church is. <laughs> that he's, by that I mean he's sometimes more aware of God's timing, uh, and he does everything he can, and fortunately, he usually overplays his hand, but when I look at what's been going on for the last 60 years or so with the underground church in China, and uh, even today, uh, some of the people I'm in contact with and doing a lot with Chinese-speaking uh, churches and leaders are highly involved with the underground church in China, and we do know the last year and a half, in fact, just uh, the coronavirus has been a bit of an excuse for the communist government. 
to bring about an increase of persecution against the church there just in the last few months. But the last two years, there's been an increase of persecution. And um, I, I think that when we look at overall what's going on, not quite yet in the Western world, but in much of Africa, South America, uh, parts of Asia, including India, uh, in the Middle East, it, it's just a tremendous time to be seeking first the kingdom of God. So uh, in the midst of all the chaos going on, I'm really, I'm really excited, you know, about uh, what, what I think God is up to and what we're going to see over the next 10, 15 years. Yeah, you know, you, you hit on something I think that's been really in my heart, and that, that is the fact that, that as hard as these things can be, it does seem like there are tremendous opportunities set before us too. And, and I love that, you know, that, that sort of uh, the way the enemy tips the hand of what God is about to do. I think about what you're saying about China. We have a number of uh, leaders connected to Patria who are in Hong Kong as well as Singapore and some of the other Asian areas. But those in Hong Kong are not only just dealing, like we're dealing with the virus and racism issues here. Hong Kong's dealing with the virus and freedom issues uh, uh, there. Uh, it does really seem like the enemy's tipping his hand. And when, when, when that comes up that way, then I guess it makes me want to ask the question. I think a lot of people ask, yeah, I, I feel like I know the answer, but I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on is this, are we walking in a season of judgment or is this, is this from God or is this, all these things, are they from the enemy? Uh, yeah, I, I think both and to, 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 to all of that. Um, uh, it, it's a theological aspect that I'm not completely qualified to expound on, but uh, I believe we're in a season where the whole earth is groaning. Um, I, without in any way wanting to sound new age or anything like that, there's, there's life God created in the earth itself. And uh, we know that uh, the earth itself cried out when Cain slew Abel. And uh, Paul said the whole earth is groaning for the revelation of the sons of God, the revealing of the sons of God. And I think that the way God has built everything with uh, life in it, <clears throat> that um, everything that can be shaken is being shaken. And I think as we see unrighteousness grow in our cultures, uh, in our lands, uh, there's just going to be more and more turmoil, both on a natural and a, um, on a cultural level, practical level as well. I think, so to speak, that we talk about God judging. Um, is the Father in heaven saying, I'm releasing judgment on this nation? Well, I think both yes and no. I, I've believed for years that some countries like the United States, we're under judgment uh, over the whole issue of abortion. Uh, you know, if the blood, cry, if the soil cried out for the blood of one man, uh, my gosh, we've had tens of millions of, of innocent babies killed. And it's not, just, it's not just that in itself, but we've got leading politicians today that champion things like third-term abortion. Um, we're, I, I think we are in a judgment, and the earth itself and everything that can be shaken is, is being shaken. But part of it is, I think we're also reaping what we're sowing. Um, if we go all the way back to the 70s, James Dobson said the greatest satanic warfare at this time in the United States is the warfare against marriage and the family. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, speaking about the current racial unrest, uh, I do not in any way want to detract from the fact that there are people in pain because of historical injustice and contemporary injustice. Uh, towards uh, minorities or the black people specifically. I don't want to in any way um, underestimate that or belittle that. But the reality is cross-cultural, uh, whatever ethnic group we're talking about, so much of the turmoil we're seeing in the Western world is because of the destruction of the family unit. And I think the way God created us, uh, he created their uh, to children to be raised in healthy families. And with a healthy father and mother, there's uh, a child grows up with 
two important things. One is a inherent sense of security that, you know, problems, problems will come. Uh, excuse me, sorry about that. No problem, I thought it was on my end, so. <laughs> problem, problems will come uh, regardless, but uh, when a child grows up in a healthy family, loved and nourished and encouraged about their future, there's more of an ability to take things in stride. And likewise, uh, in a healthy family, a child grows up with an inherent sense of self-esteem, that they're valued, a sense of um, not just security, but a sense of value. And we've got so many people, and again, this is not, uh, this crosses all ethnic cultural boundaries, but we're now coming to the second generation of so many kids have grown up they're now young adults or older, that they've got so much inner turmoil inside without a sense of value, without a sense of security. And, you know, most psychologists will say that where there's prolonged periods of fear, that eventually will turn to anger. And that anger, if not healed, will turn to all sorts of destructive behavior. So again, this, I'm not trying to make a one-all, one-size-fits-all statement about the unrest in our culture today, but I think on several levels, um, uh, we're reaping what we've sown, and the earth itself is coming out. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I preached this sermon a few years ago, I think, on, on the symptoms of the earth's sickness, and so I, I do think we're dealing with, with those, that combination of things. When we look at all of these issues that we're dealing with, and not just the U.S.'s issues, but like Hong Kong's uh, fight for their freedoms and the racial injustice here and the coronavirus around the world and, and different issues with the way we've seen responses. Uh, some nations, some places being locked down and closed down, even you know continuing on in depth, others releasing quicker. How does the church respond to these things? What, what kind of responsibility do we have? Well, that's a, uh, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's a uh, in-depth question there. <laughs> you know, um, I think specifically there's three areas in the Bible that we see um, God uh, leading his people to not necessarily obey some specific laws. One of those has to do with worshiping God. Um, uh, a second has to do with the right to, to preach the gospel, to share Christ. And a third is our call to disobey unrighteous laws. Um, I mean, uh, some of the uh, midwives during the time, as we mentioned, that. Uh, Pharaoh was having the Hebrew children re refuse to do that. And um, I think by and large, most of the churches I'm, I'm involved with, which I do a lot of ministry in a, a lot of different networks of churches, a lot of different denominations. From what I've seen in the United States, I think that the church has walked this fine line well. Um, it's a whole other topic, the, the, ser the seriousness or the ultra seriousness of COVID-19, you know, I, I'm, I have <laughs> some different thoughts on that. Right. But I do think uh, as the politicians and the doctors or scientists were saying, in the early days, uh, March, maybe April, I think it was important to practice some degree of safe sheltering and dis social distancing until the curve was flattened. Uh, but over the last month, what I think we've seen, and uh, my gosh, I want to I want to try to say this without uh, trying to make a political statement, but a number of the states uh, that have really stood out of being more severe in restriction, um, I think some of those leaders are coming from a philosophical and you want to call it theological. Uh, uh, posture that they just do not value God, do not worship the value of God. Um, in my home church, um, uh, because I, I travel about 120, 140 days a year, uh, I'm part of the pastoral team when I'm here, but uh, we just sent a letter, I think, um, late last week 
to the governor of, of California, Governor Newsom, and informing him that whether he changed the restrictions or not, uh, we were going to be meeting as a church on uh, Father's Day, uh, June 21st. And we did it in unity. Our church has worked hard over the last 30 years at pursuing unity. So we're in East San Diego County. I think we've got 25 churches that signed on to that. And a lot of these churches are large, influential churches. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that uh, there are times when God calls his people to disobey civil authority, Paul also told us to honor authority and to pray for authority. And so I think it's been right up to a certain point to thoroughly honor um, some of the edicts that have come down. But I think when we see it crossing a line, uh, for example, here in California, uh, a church can only have 25% of its occupancy or 100 people, whatever is uh, greatest. And so our sanctuary can hold 1,700 people. It's ridiculous for us to be able to have 100 people there mm. because uh, I've been four or five times into a Home Depot and I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people in there at one time. Last time I was there, I was walking down one of the aisles trying to find something. There was no social distancing being practiced. Right. Um, restaurants uh, can have, um, you know, uh, half their capacity. And if they have 200 people capacity, they can have 100 people in there. If they have 300, they can have 150. So I, I think that there's some discrimination that's been going on. And um, I, I won't go as far as so far as say all these particular governors are anti-Christ in their outlook, but I think there has been a subtle, maybe even unintentional, but a subtle discrimination against the church. And I think worshiping God, and I, I think a lot of people that are in a lot of turmoil right now, uh, because of, uh, for one thing, maybe uh, single folks who have been, uh, have, have felt a, sen a real sense of isolation, but as well, people with serious questions about their economic future, their jobs, their careers, um, as well as over the last week and a half now, uh, the, the unrest, the racial tensions in our country that have surfaced. Um, I, I think uh, to be able to meet with other Christians, pray together, worship together, and hear encouraging messages, it's absolutely an essential. It's not a non-essential. It is an essential business. So I, I think there's a fine line there. And so uh, I think there's a time that we have to say, uh, we respect you, we honor you as leaders, we're praying for you, but this is not right at this point, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I love that balanced approach. I, you know, I've told people through the whole process, it, I think we've had the balance between an Acts approach and a Romans approach to how we handle this, between that place of honoring versus saying we have to obey God first. And it does feel like we've crossed that line in so many places. And, but, but I think it's important that we've been balanced and we've set a tone of being balanced with that. I love that approach to things. How do we, how do we look coming out of this? What's the church going to look like? Are we changed or do things go back to normal? I mean, regardless of the, how many people can meet together, what does this do to us around the world as a church? Well, I, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm really excited about this time frame uh, we're in this season. Um, this, you know, what we call in Christianity Easter weekend, you know, historically it's Passover. And this Passover that, hand, that took place back in April was absolutely historical. It was only the second Passover in all of history, some 3,400 years in which uh, the people of God had to stay home. Uh, and speaking with some Jewish leaders from Israel, I found that at Passover, they typically bring uh, multi-families together. They have friends together at Passover. But in Exodus 12 of that first Passover, every family was to be in their own home. They were to have their cloaks on, their staffs in their hand, their sandals on, so to speak, to be ready for action. And as far as I know, this is only the second Passover in all of history where the, if the people of God have had to be in their homes, could not congregate. And that speaks to me that, that God's up to something. And we've been, uh, since uh, mid-March, we've been in this time 
of what I'm calling an enforced sabbatical. Um, uh, I think a lot of us, despite good intentions, myself included, we're, we've made an idol out of busyness. It could be career busyness, uh, sport busyness, it could be ministry busyness, but I think particularly sometimes for Christians, and particularly I should say for leaders, we confuse what we're doing for God with our relationship with God. And I know for me, and I, I suspect for a lot of Christians, that it, it's been very beneficial this time where, and I do realize a lot of people do, are continuing on with their jobs, it's been considered essential. But it's been a, a time of, of being able to slow our pace down. And all of a sudden, you know, we have more times for our devotions. And I'm not saying just <clears throat> doing times of prayer and worship and Bible reading religiously or just to, you know, uh, hit the check boxes, you know. But to say, Lord, what are you saying? What are you doing? Uh, we, we do know that, you know, contrary to what I would have done when Jesus is anointed and then empowered by the Holy Spirit, I would have gone straight into ministry. But the first thing he was led to do was go spend, you know, those 40 days alone with the Father, you know. And I think that uh, God has been uh, wanting to, and hopefully we've been hearing him, give us some fresh strategies, some fresh perspectives on what we're doing. You know, it, it's like life. There's a lot of things we do <clears throat> that at a certain season are even inspired by God and correct. But at other seasons, you know, it's time to shift uh, new directions. And way back in early March, I felt like the Lord uh, gave me a word that he was going to be giving fresh innovation and creativity to the church. And that didn't mean just uh, all of a sudden we're doing a million Zoom meetings, but I think it means he wants to give us some fresh strategies for reaching our communities. And so I, I've, uh, although Pentecost was last weekend, uh, I feel we're coming into a Pentecost season. And if it's okay, before we end this time together, I'd just like to say a prayer of blessing on yes. whoever may be hearing this, but I believe we're coming into a fresh uh, outpouring, a fresh move of the Holy Spirit. And I think that this, this enforced sabbatical we've been in has been actually to prepare us for that. So, um, I mean, uh, you know, being, being obviously a, a, a white person, I think one of the big things I can do in response to all the uh, uh, racial tension right now is to take a bit more time and listen and uh, listen to the heartaches, listen to where uh, particularly black people and uh, spokespeople for the black community, where they're coming from. It doesn't mean I may agree with everything, might, might not be, be agree with some of the measures they're calling forth, but uh, I think that, again, we're so busy, you know, following the, the riots at Ferguson and uh, other things, uh, the first wave of the Black Lives Matters protest a few years ago, we talked a lot about things, but did we ever say, let's, let's really listen to one another? So I think even with all the racial tension going on, I think some, particularly among uh, Christians and Christian leaders, there's going to come a, a, a new uh, emphasis on us to build relationship, not just for the sake of let's just deal with this mess, but how can we move forward in, in ways that are really going to be beneficial to, to our nation, you know? Yeah, you know, I, I think about these things, and I, I think the uh, there's such a need for the church to have a response. In some ways, I, I wonder if we were really ready, you know, really prepared for what we've dealt with. Uh, and then I back up and say, no, maybe this has been a really good thing because it's getting us ready for what's next. Yeah, you know, I heard some people say it's a reset button, or the, I think the best I heard was a, it's a CELA moment to stop and and be still and and reconnect and i think listening is a part of that so i i love the way you connect that with the the the, the stepping back and, and pausing for a moment that covid19 sort of forced on us coupled yeah. with the stepping back and not just listening to god but listening to others around us that the racial tensions have somewhat forced upon us those are really really good things for the church um, now, I guess I'm going to 
ask a more pointed question in regard to specific parts of the church and, and you having worked with John Paul and the prophetic protocol documents and things you've done, I, I kind of have some ideas of, of where you might go with this, but I, I look around me and I see the prophetic voices of the church in my mind, in some way struggling with current circumstances. Um, and I don't know, some of those voices almost seem to be bringing forth soulish um, uh, declarations that fit what they want them to. Others seem to be very generic and not um, addressing prophetically where we are. Um, Patria, this the group that we're doing this for, I, who all may see it in the end, I don't know, but our family of ministries have that prophetic DNA from John Paul and that character over giftedness, and those things kind of bother me. What What is the role of the prophetic? What do you what is the prophetic voice supposed to be doing now? And are we doing okay with it? I can, I can keep running with that one. I'll leave it there and see where you go. So, um, no, I, I, I don't think, uh, uh, a certain percentage, maybe a <clears throat> big percentage of the prophetic community is dealing well with a lot of things. Um, and if I, if I could, I'd, I'd like to set a foundation for answering that by going back to the, uh, the question, uh, original question uh, that we talked about a couple of days ago, uh, you wanted to ask about what is the state of the church? Um, I, this is, we can have all sorts of analogies, all, all sorts of metaphorical ways of looking at things, but I, I, I put the church in America right now into four categories. First of all, there's the apostate church, uh, churches that at one time, so even some denominations that were just avid about preaching the gospel that no longer maybe even believe in a resurrected Christ, you know, and the cross, the virgin birth, and all of that. Um, and so uh, that's kind of out of the equation, you know, a, a huge percentage of people that used to have, I think, solid Judaic Christian values, they're now open to all sorts of things, including um, uh, postmodernism, secularism, and uh, liberalism. Uh, but then when we talk about the church that still believes uh, in varying degrees to not only the virgin birth, but the uh, resur uh, crucifixion and the resurrection, um, there's an aspect of the church that I, I would call the uh, anti-lordship pro-salvation church, that Jesus is not only Savior, but he's Lord. And I think particularly in the Western world, particularly in America, um, you know, it's so hard to separate cultural values sometimes from biblical values. Um, and I think our, um, and let me preface this by saying, I'm not someone who always cracks down on the American church. Uh, I for one have been tired for about 20 years of uh, leaders of the body of Christ in uh, many other nations coming to America to raise funds, but then they just continually preach against us. You know? yeah. They want to point out all our faults, but they're happy to receive our checks, you know? So I think we, uh, I'm not anti the American church, but I think it is, is a problem that consumerism, our consumer oriented society today, uh, there's been a, a bit of a, uh, of a marriage between our that cultural value and how we perceive God, um, almost like God's uh, just a big Santa Claus, supernatural Santa Claus. And in that part of the church, uh, even that does believe in the gifts of the Spirit, particularly prophecy, prophecy is going to be uh, perceived as uh, a way of just bringing down blessings. And... Um, and sometimes God wants to say some hard things. And I know that there's a school of thought in some churches, even some churches I respect, that they believe God will never uh, say something, uh, something that smacks of judgment. But there is, you know, um, uh, what I call remedial judgment, whereas it says in Hebrews that God chastises those he loves because he's a good father. He doesn't do it to destroy us. He does it to build us up and to bring healing. And uh, uh, the, the third part of the church I, I, I would like to identify is 
I, I, I call them the Pharisaical church. And most people, when they think about Pharisees, they, they think about legalism. But there's another aspect of Phariseeism, and that is the Pharisees did things to be noticed by men. They wanted to be popular. They wanted to have a huge following. That's really, uh, at the end of the day, and, and uh, practically speaking, what got Jesus crucified, their popularity was being threatened. Their power base was being threatened. And in that part of the body of Christ, uh, especially with leaders, there's, a, I think, a, a real, if not fear, a, a, a strong hesitancy to say anything that in our perspective, would bring conviction. They're afraid of offending people. And they say, well, God is never offensive. God is offensive simply because he's God. Uh, he's never afraid of saying, we're going to do things my way. And if you don't like it, you can reap the consequences. Um, and I think that, for example, when we touch on areas like uh, same-sex marriage and a whole milieu of things like that, there's a lot of leaders who are afraid to touch on that out of afraid of offending people. And they say, well, we just need to be nice and polite to everybody. But what kind of surgeon or doctor would it be who didn't tell a, uh, a patient they have cancer because they didn't want them to feel bad? Um, that uh, that aspect of the church, you know, that a lot of preachers have these really clever sound bites and <clears throat> great media presentations um, and these <clears throat> sermons that on a superficial level, an emotional level, make everybody feel good. But the challenge to lay down your life, the challenge to pick up your cross daily, the challenge to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus and die to self, that aspect is, is missing. And I say all of that to bring me to what I call um, part of the prophetic community that has what I call a party spirit. By party, I don't mean drinking and, you know, that sort of thing, but I mean like an ideological party that they're in lockstep with a certain culture. And um, I equate this with Micaiah in the Old Testament. I, I've been speaking a lot about Micaiah when I do advanced prophetic training. And we all know the story. Um, King Ahab called for, uh, who was it, Jehoshaphat, and said, should we go and get that land that was taken years ago that belongs to Israel? And Jehoshaphat said, I'm, I'm with you, but let's consult the prophets. And so uh, Ahab had his 300 prophets, and there's nothing to say that they were con consistently false prophets, but they all uh, got together and they prophesied, yes, God will be with you. He'll give you complete victory of the enemy. In fact, one of them, the leader, of those 300, he even gave what I call a, uh, a, a bling prophecy. And he, uh, he got this, the metal and he shaped, uh, fashioned some horns out of it. And this is why I call, I call a prophecy that's really over dramatized and, you know, it's, it's blinged up, you know, right. as if, they, you know, as if that's the anointing, you know. But uh, then Jehoshaphat, who actually was a very godly man, uh, you know, I think he sent some, some sense from the Holy Spirit, things were not right here. And he said, don't you have any more prophets? And Ahab said, well, there's one Micaiah, but I don't like him. He always prophesies negative things to me. And they called Micaiah, and Micaiah, when he came, he had a, this great gift of uh, sarcasm. And uh, Ahab said, what should we do? This is our plan. He said, oh, yeah, go for it. You know, you'll have, everything will go well. Go for it. But now even Ahab's beginning to get a little bit uh, convicted. Um, and he says, tell me, what is the Lord saying to you? And it's interesting. Micaiah began by saying, well, let me tell you what I saw. And he saw a vision of the throne of God. And that speaks volumes to me because I think we have a lot of people that are somewhat prophetically gifted, but they're not, they're not, how can I put it? Our hearts are filters and we can be hearing from God, but if our heart has filters such as um, insecurity, a need to be needed, wanting to please man, or likewise, if there's bitterness, anger, it's going to filter what the Lord is saying. And I, I, don't, I don't say that 
that people are not necessarily not hearing from God, but I think things are being very filtered. And I think we have a lot of prophets, uh, prophetic voices that are wanting to please everybody and gain popularity. And, uh, you know, uh, it probably doesn't sell as many CDs to, or, or downloads to say, you know, um, God's going to deal with us. <laughs> we all want to hear about the blessings. But Micaiah began with this revelation of the throne of God. And I think there are a lot of prophetic voices. In fact, a lot of people in ministry are not ministering out of uh, a deeper revelation of the holiness of God, the majesty of Christ. Um, uh, and I think first and foremost, someone who's really called to the prophetic ministry and or the ministry of the prophet, their foundation should be uh, a revelation of the majesty, the glory, and the holiness of Christ Jesus. I mean, those that have had that hear this cry of holy, holy, holy art thou, Lord God. And, and not that that should ever bring condemnation, but that's a foundation that it's not God who's out of balance, he's man who's out of balance. And sometimes we need prophecies. And, uh, and um, in the 35, 40 years of most I've been involved in international stuff, I have given some hard words. Um, I remember one time in uh, October of 94, we were based with the church in Toronto, the airport venue at that time in the midst of the outpouring. And I was informed by a friend that there were, he was bringing a group of 60, 70 pastors from Japan, the first group of Japanese pastors coming to Toronto. And uh, could I do some meetings that week for them? And I, I ended up taking the, the nightly renewal meetings we were doing that week, but also I did some private meetings. And in praying about being with them, the Lord had given me a very hard word because Japan, as you probably know, is one of the hardest nations in the world to evangelize. And at that time, in the autumn of 94, Japan had basically the strongest economy in the world. And the Japanese culture was very proud and um, uh, self-sufficient. They disdained the need for charity. And, you know, uh, I'm not anti-Japanese. I love the Japanese people. I've ministered there, but it was a stronghold. And the Lord said to me, I'm going to shake the nation of Japan, Japan over the next six months five ways. He said, I'm going to shake it politically. I'm going to shake it the, the weather. I'm going to shake it economically. I'm going to shake it culturally. I'm going to shake the earth itself. And the Lord said, I'm doing this not because I'm against Japanese people, but I want to create a hunger for the gospel, a need for me. And I gave it to the Japanese pastors and one of the meetings with them, and they were very polite, but they really didn't receive it. You know, because when you have the greatest economy in the world, it's, it's hard to hear your economy is going to be shaken. Well, over the next six months, uh, first, there was a major windstorm on the South Island, Japan, that caused major damage. Then there was huge political scandal. I think one or two, at least one, maybe two of the higher ranking cabinet members had to resign in a scandal. Three, uh, and um, this really shook the nation. And you may remember uh, the cult group let off the poisonous gas in the bullet train. I think 29 people died. Nothing like that had happened in their recent history. It shook the nation to the core. And then four, uh, uh, just almost overnight, the economy tanked. It collapsed. And a few years ago, I, I met with a few Christian leaders that are also high-ranking economists in Japan, and they said, still to this day, the economy of Japan has not come back to where it was. And then almost six months to the day, uh, when I gave that word, um, the Kobe earthquake hit that just severely. And, and I, I saw firsthand how that was a, 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 what we call remedial judgment. It was not a word of condemnation, but a word of, I love you too much to let you keep going the way you are. And I saw firsthand when I was with the church a year and a half, two years later in Kobe, a church that prior to the earthquake had been around 100, which was a large church for Japan. They had grown through evangelism to three or 400. 
because there had been devastation all around them and they began to serve free breakfasts, people in their community and do laundry for people that can no longer do it because, you know, no gas and electricity. Right. <clears throat> and, and as I said, charity, the need for charity had been somewhat despised in Japan. Um, but all of a sudden there's people that they needed help and the church had an opportunity to let, let the love of God flow in a practical way. And um, uh, I, personally, I love getting a word of, Mark, I love you. I'm going to bless you now more you've ever experienced. I'll, I'll take those all day long. But I think we have to remember that I think the number one will of God for every single Christian is in Romans 8, 29, I think it is, that we become conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. Yeah. So I think sometimes in our culture, which has impacted the culture of the church, we shortchange God with what it really means to be blessed. Mm. And it could be that correction, as difficult as it may be, uh, as it says in the word, it may be difficult at night, but joy comes in the morning. Sometimes we need that. And, uh, and so this is a very long-winded way of answering your question, but okay. I think there's part of the prophetic community at large that is just focused on superficial blessings and possibly out of a low revelation of the glory and majesty of Christ and the holiness of Christ uh, that could be part of the problem but there's this thing about wanting to please men mm. and then real quickly the fourth um, the fourth category or area of the church I see today is straight out of Malachi 3 and if I could just read three verses to you yes Malachi 3 verses 16 through 18, four verses, but um, three verses. But Malachi said, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another and the Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and who esteemed his name. Hmm. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my uh, treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you will distinguish between the righteous and wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. In, in reading that and talking about that, I'm not saying that some people who call Jesus Christ their Savior and Lord are not saved. I think whoever calls upon the name of the Lord is, is, is saved, as Peter said. And I don't, I don't want to get into, I'm not really qualified to theologically <laughs> sort that out. You know, I think only God is. But I do think we're going to see, and I think we have seen it already. I've seen it in many cities with some of the churches I've worked with. I'm sure you've seen it as well. But oftentimes the unsaved in a community, in a city, they see a difference between those churches that are really alive and really working uh, to help the community, as opposed to those that are more like a religious club. And I think um, whether we're talking about healings, miracles, signs, and wonders, or practical love, the love of Christ shown in a practical way to hurt the hurting in our community, on a myriad of ways, being the salt and light of the earth, I think uh, not just within the church, but even non believers, uh, because we know in the book of Acts and some of the communities, even the non believers held the church in high esteem. Right. I think we're going to see this. Uh, this fourth group within the body of Christ that um, not only believes in prophecy, believe on seeking the Lord. They, like Paul said, they do not hold back from giving the full counsel of God. They, they, they take the fullness of what the Lord Jesus has said, what he is saying, and we want to lay down our lives uh, by God's grace. I think we're going to see more and more of an emerging of those churches, no matter what denomination they may be, no matter what network. And there could be many different expressions of that. I'm not looking for some one size fits all expression. You know, God never does anything faint by numbers. But uh, I do think we're going to see this, this Ma uh, Malachi 3 church, if I could call it that, really having more and more prominence. Right. That was probably more than you wanted to hear, but uh, no, no, that's great. That's great. In fact, it, it, it really is. It really goes right into the, one of the questions I, I wanted to be sure to ask before we ended with with what were you seeing coming? What you know, 
what prophetically, what just even naturally speaking do you see for the church as we, we move into the second half of this year? So you already already began down that road with seeing that. So I love it. It's great. So. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I'm excited. I, uh, you know, I, I think with different churches, different leaders, God is going to be speaking some fresh things, innovative ways about reaching out to our community and, and obviously, one of the things we realize right now is we need to work harder at building relationship with those of different culture. You know, uh, um, uh, part of the, the difference, if I could put this in a broad context between the, the white church and the black church, a lot of it, uh, although there it possibly is some, well, definitely in some areas there is racism, but I think part of it is cultural. And... Uh, I think in the style of worship, even how uh, in a lot of white churches, we tend to dress very casually, whereas a number of, I know when I go and speak in a black church, I'll usually wear a suit, which I, I don't normally do, but I'll do that to honor their culture. Right. Um, uh, a lot of times, uh, I think one of the things we need to talk through is uh, what what is the difference between cultural differences we have between in the body of Christ as opposed to what differences are possibly due to racism and how can we bring a correction to that? How can we build relationship, but at the same time, not dissing each other's culture? You know? Right. Not, do, not to try to not handle unity in a superficial way. You know? Well, and that, that's such a powerful thing because I, I was just sharing with some of our leaders this week that it feels like, it feels like we've ignored too many questions. Uh, we just said, well, we don't want to deal with it. So let's just ignore it that we're having to open up and ask. And that's, you know, that's a great point to recognize. There are going to be things we find that aren't wrong. And there are going to be things we find that are wrong and distinguishing the difference so we can move forward. Honestly, is, is, is a powerful, powerful thing for us. Uh, it's really good. Well, this is this is just uh, I really appreciate uh, where you've been with this and, and just sort of the encouragement you've been with the things you're seeing and the things you shared. Uh, t tell folks uh, the, some of our folks know you, some of our folks don't. Uh, before we close out, just tell folks a little bit about what you do. I probably should have started with that, but hey, we'll come back to it here. I'm sure you've got resources, maybe they're available. How can folks find them? Uh, things like that, uh, just to, to give a better feel for who you are and what you're doing. Well, we're, uh, I don't know, I, I guess uh, our ministry is, uh, could say I'm, I'm a little bit strange in that I cover a lot of different things that primarily I'm, I'm known for prophetic ministry in some circles. I'm probably known for prophetic ministry, but um, uh, I do a lot of different things. Uh, we do do a lot of teaching and training, as uh, your network does, on knowing the voice of God. We have three different schools. We do kind of a one-on-one. Uh, we call it communing with the Father, uh, which is just basically hearing from God as our birthright as the sons and daughters of God. Then we do a secondary stage of training. And then we do uh, an advanced school that usually we, it, you have to have. It's a very small group, and you have to have pastoral permission to go to that. And it's for people that are actually called, they feel called in their heart to prophetic lifestyle, whether speaking to church or in media or government, whatever, it doesn't matter what, what area. But we also do a lot of training on healing and praying for the sick. We, I, I love to pray for the sick and we uh, get to see the Lord do a lot in those areas. But as well, I teach a lot on worship and, and prayer. Um, but the main thrust is prophetic. But um, one resource uh, I, I would like to mention, and uh, I, I don't mean to do a cheesy segue here, but uh, we've, I've written about six, seven books, I think, and uh, do a lot of CD stuff. But um, a book we wrote about eight years ago is called Breakthrough in Times of Breakdown. And I wrote that because I began to see some real miracles happen in a lot of people I knew who their businesses or their careers or their personal uh, savings that were devastated in 2008. I knew people who had lost their houses, lost their mortgages, lost their pensions, lost everything. Uh, but I also began to see a lot of these people, God do some miracles. And so 
the Lord kind of stirred me with Psalm 37, 18 and 19, that the righteous will prosper even during a time of famine. I ended up putting a seminar a conference together, did a lot of it at that time. <clears throat> but then I, uh, I, I wrote the book, um, hold up there, Breakthrough in Times of Breakdown, Breakthrough in Times of Breakdown. And it's, it's not just centered on, on the quoting the promises of God and how can we get, get those promises, but it's talking about the ways of God. For example, in one of the first chapters, we talk about kingdom living is in the giving. And we talk about one of the great keys is when you end up short, short of finances, short of wisdom, short of relationships, whatever, that to uh, do what the disciples did with the loaves and fishes when everybody's hungry, they took the little they had, they put in the hands of Jesus, that it is better to give than to receive. And so we're not concerned about, the book is not focused on just getting people blessed, but how do we walk in the ways of Christ? You know, um, going all the way back to Genesis, do the things you should do, and it will go well with you, as do his discipleship. But it's a short book, I don't know, about 100 pages or so, actually less than 100 pages, but, um, and uh, I'm not trying to sell books, but I, I know for a fact that this has helped a whole lot of people that uh, have been going through in the last seven or eight years, difficult times, challenging times, because there are, you know, there's some 3,000 promises of blessings in the Bible. And uh, I think, as Paul said, every one of those are yes and amen. So hmm. how can we qualify ourselves to walk in that, that reality? Good. Now, how and, can people find that? Uh, uh, just through our website, which is Mark with a C. M-A-R-C-A DuPont, Mark A. DuPont Ministries, um, dot com. And uh, it's all lowercase, just markadupontministries.com. And uh, uh, they can get it there. They can also download it, you know, and things like that. But uh, but if it's okay before we break, I, uh, I feel so strong about this Pentecost season. Is it okay, Michael, if I just say a blessing? Yeah, actually, the last thing I wanted you to do was to pray for folks and, 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 and release blessings. So that's a great way to wrap things up. So why don't you do that? Well, Father, I want to thank you in the name of Jesus for every single person watching this. And Lord, no matter where they're at in their journey with you, whether they've known you for many decades or maybe maybe they're just in the process of you opening up their hearts to your reality and your love and your grace, Lord God. I ask, Father God, and every, people watch, every person watching this right now, that just as on the day of Pentecost some 2,000 years ago, would you Fill them with your power, Holy Spirit. And Father, particularly uh, all the tree of people, Lord God, that are serving you, that are going for it, seeking first the kingdom of God. I ask, Lord God, just as your word says, that you will bring times of refreshing the Holy Spirit. So many folks, Lord, have been under so much stress and so much anxiety, so many questions. I ask that even as they're watching this right now, Holy Spirit, would you come upon them? Would you fill them with your kingdom peace, your kingdom joy, the love of the Father? But would you anoint them with power, I ask in the name of Jesus. And Father, just as they prayed when they came under threat in the early days church in Acts 4 and told not to preach the gospel more, but they prayed, Lord, give us a boldness to share Jesus and let your hand move in healings and miracles, signs and wonders. I ask that you would anoint people now with a boldness and give them different strategies, different ways, new divine appointments to share Christ and to make Christ known. But I also ask, Lord God, that you would anoint them for prophecy, you anoint them for healings and miracles, signs and wonders. And I pray that both in practical ways, but also in supernatural ways, even as Paul said, he did not preach the gospel with uh, clever words or persuasion of man but in demonstration of the spirit and your dunamis power, would you anoint people and fill them right now, fill them with your dynamite dunamis power to bring healing and restoration, Lord. And I thank you for these folks. And I pray you uh, just carry them into a new season of greater fruitfulness and let your joy be their strength, Father. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, Mark, for joining us. I, I know people are going to appreciate it. We, we really do uh, just want to bless you as well. 
thank, thank you. you for the time you've taken with us today. Thank you. So good to be with you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.